It is said that the root of all sickness is homesickness. And there's something very deep and very true about that saying. This year, uh, we've been exploring uh, often the theme of refuge, those places or people, activities, ideas, experiences that help us feel protected and nourished, uh, places where we can go for sanctuary, uh, literal places. I was recently in Joshua Tree National Park, one of my own personal deep refuges. And also sometimes these places are more internal states of being, such as a sense of calming or the knowing that uh, there's a lovingness in your own heart or that others or at least one other person do appreciate you. These are, these are refuges for us. In effect, going back to playing hide and go seek, one of my favorite games as a kid, uh, when you finally make it back to the home base and you touch it before they tag you, Ali Ali Oxen, home, free, free, free. You're home, you're home. So I want to explore the topic of home with you uh, and remembrance of home as a practice, not re remembrance or a longing uh, for uh, a home you once had and don't have anymore, but I mean remembrance of our true home, the home that is always with us, actually, wherever we go. That's what I'd like to talk about with you tonight. And um, I'll be exploring, in effect, three levels, three depths, we could say, three ways of relating to what is our true home, uh, beginning with uh, something that is relatively immediate and close at hand in our experience, then moving into respect for the deepening realizations that are available to people on the path of awakening as they find more and more their own sense of true home. So as usual, I'll hold forth for around, I don't know, 20 minutes or so, and then try to open it up for some good discussion and questions and comments. Uh, you're welcome to use the chat feature and comment uh, along the way. Uh, you can send a direct message to some person. We ask that if you use the chat feature, you do use it you know, responsibly and focus on your own personal practice rather than criticizing or advising others. And if you don't want to use the chat feature, uh, if you push the chat button at the bottom of your screen, that whole sidebar will disappear. Okay, so the first of three levels of home is what I call the green zone which speaks to the Buddha's teaching about the transition between the second and third noble truth. The first noble truth, as you probably know, is that there is suffering. It's not the entirety of life, but it's a common feature of many lives, and it's present in all lives, at least some of the time. And um, he made the point that it's possible in a second noble truth to realize that so much of our suffering, so much of the add-on suffering we bring to the inherent unavoidable pains and losses of this mortal life, the add-on suffering is driven largely, some might say even entirely, by different forms of craving, different forms of pressured, contracted, driven insistence about one thing or another, including in a very subtle, kind of granular way inside us. That craving then drives a lot of suffering, but it's actually possible to release that craving uh, increasingly and at the culmination of the awakening process in, a, in an ultimate, irrevocable, and complete kind of way. So what causes craving? Craving arises when we don't feel like our needs are met, pure and simple. Craving is a natural biological process in the broadest sense. So what do we need? We need to be safe, satisfied, and connected. These are our three primary needs, or it's a way of describing our needs. It's a framework that is grounded in biology and grounded in psychology, and it's a framework in terms of the three needs that is implicit in a lot of, a lot of things. Um, and I summarize it as you know, our fundamental need for safety, satisfaction, and connection, needs that we share with other animals, uh, non-human animals, who pursue those needs in their own ways. Well, when you experience in the moment, in the present, that there is an enoughness of safety, 
then uh, fear and anger and helplessness start falling away. And you feel increasingly grounded in an authentic sense of calm strength, peacefulness. Also, when there is a felt sense of enough satisfaction in the brain, be nice to have more. And there's a thankfulness for what you have already. There's a sense of enoughness already, of fullness already. When that happens, uh, qualities of drivenness and stressful striving, uh, preoccupation with disappointments and loss, those fall away, replaced by a growing sense of contentment. And as well, with regard to connection, when in the present, there's a sense of an enoughness of connection, positive connections, an enoughness of caring flowing out from you, and an enoughness, and enoughness of caring flowing in. When that is the case, then feelings of inadequacy and resentment start falling away, and they're replaced increasingly by a feeling of love. When any animal, including a human animal, is undisturbed, when it's not rattled, when it's really fed, when it, when it feels like it's not under threat in the moment, it's not about to die in the moment, no shark is chewing on its leg in the moment, when, when the organism, when the animal, when the human feels positively connected you know, with others, then what happens is the whole body, the body and the mind defaults to its resting state. And the resting state of any dynamic system is its home base. It is its equilibrium condition. So when we do practices that help us get in touch with an underlying sense of, okay, in this moment, in the present, safe enough, I can still see threats, I can still be strong, I can still deal with things, but in my core, there's the basis for a fundamental peace. We can do the same thing with satisfaction. We know there are problems to solve, we know there are goals to pursue, on the basis of feeling contented already. And the same with connection. When we feel, yeah, there, there is positive connection coming toward me, there's an outflow of connection, and most fundamentally, I'm abiding, you are abiding in a field of relatedness with nature, with other people, um, rested there. To the extent that we can train in the sense of this, the experience of this, I call it the green zone, deep green, in which we're not swept away by fighting or fleeing or freezing. When you rest there increasingly, it feels like, ah, oh, this is home. This is home. When you see, you know, uh, a, an animal, a non-human animal, a cat, just kind of sitting there in the sun, plopped, content, that cat is returning to its sense of the green zone in its own way. We are now living with our daughter's cat, which is as well as our daughter. This is pretty great. So in the same way, uh, when, you know, I had a teacher who wrote a book called The Eating Gorilla Comes in Peace. <laughs> you know, when we feel satisfied enough, uh, you know, then we're not chasing the next thing and fighting with other people for the next scrap. It's okay. It's okay. So this is the first level. This is the first level of coming home. There's a, there's a sense that we can cultivate again and again and again in which there's less and less basis for craving. There's more and more of a sense of fullness rather than something missing. There's more and more of a sense of balance, even keeledness, deep down inside, even if you're rattled on the surface, deep down it's calmer and more stable. That sense of balance starts to replace a sense of disturbance and being agitated and, you know, off-center. And the body memory, the emotional memory, the somatic memory of the green zone again and again and again becomes an internalized refuge, a place you can go, a place you can get in touch with, a place where you can take your stand increasingly as you go through your day. 
it's understandable if we lose touch with it. Things happen outside us that rattle us, that sweep us in one direction or another, but then we can come home again. We can recover within some minutes, hopefully within some days, and again, we get in touch with this underlying sense of peacefulness, contentment, and love, undisturbed, untroubled in the core of your being. That's the first kind of home. And the cultivation with practice of the sense of this again and again and again is incredibly useful. It's the basis, in my view, of any kind of deep Buddhist practice, certainly, and practice, I think, in other traditions, too. And also, it's the foundation of resilience. To have a deeply internalized, hardwired, somatically grounded sense of calm strength, a sense of having enough already so they don't feel desperate in terms of satisfaction, and also an internalized sense of an unconditional decency and lovingness uh, and compassion for yourself. You know, these are incredibly useful resources for the most messed up day of your life. Okay. So someone wrote me, and it's a really important question. I'm not at all talking about positive thinking. You know, let's be really clear. The Buddha developed his teachings, and I'm essentially talking about the teaching of equanimity. And I'm grounding the Buddha's teaching of equanimity in an evolutionary neurobiological framework in terms of our fundamental needs, right? Well, those teachings arose 2,500 years ago when times were really hard for most people. Um, women were oppressed, slavery was common, brutal wars happened all the time. There was no sense of civil society as we you know, aspire to it and have some beginnings of intimations of it today. Uh, it was tough. It was not some kind of pie in the sky era. And here too, the Buddha was talking about an unshakable deliverance of mind, an unshakable sense of peacefulness, contentment, and love that was not contingent on external conditions. So to be clear, now of course, if someone loses four family members to the coronavirus, initially there's going to be what the Buddha called the first darts. The sorrow, the loss, maybe the outrage, the sense of helplessness, the second guessing of yourself, any and all of it, desperately trying to figure out what to do now, you know, all of that. Okay, those are the first darts. But those first darts, the inherent unavoidable sense of sorrow or shock or dismay, or, you know, you can think of other examples where we're dealing with really tough things. We can feel them, but do we need to be agitated in our relationship with them? If there is great sorrow, do we need to be agitated in our relationship to the great sorrow? Or, we, or can we simply feel the great sorrow without adding a lot of crud to it? like getting ang at angry at all kinds of other people, for example. That's really possible. And then as we move through the wave, as the shock of those first darts and the understandable impact on us kind of fades, then increasingly what remains? What do we start to experience in the space between those darts, even when they're first showering upon us? Is there any sense of space, any sense of what is not that loss, what is not that shock, that outrage. Initially, we can have a, you know, as we train more and more, when things happen to us, we hold on to that underlying sense of a, a deep fundamental peacefulness and, and worth and good heartedness. And even if we can't stay in touch with it at the beginning, we can increasingly return to it, especially with practice and internalization again and again and again of that felt sense of being at home, being okay, here and now. Okay. So that's, that's the first level of home. And one of the things that's been extremely useful for me is to really get serious about craving and not craving and the mindful awareness of subtleties of craving, of subtle resistances to what's unpleasant, subtle chasing after what is pleasant, and subtle clingings to what is heartfelt. To become increasingly aware of that 
and in the real and in real time use use the feeling of enoughness already to undermine the automatic habitual machinery of craving that's a fantastic practice it's it's a double winner <laughs> You're disengaging from craving and you're hardwiring into yourself good feelings and inner resources uh, uh, broadly related to peacefulness, contentment, and love. Remember this home again and again, many times a day. Remembrance of home, remembrance of your home base, remembrance of who you are when you're undisturbed. Remembrance of the feeling of fullness, of enoughness. Nice to have more, already full. Remembrance of that feeling again and again, returning to it with a breath, returning to it with some lovingness toward another person, returning to it with a sense of um, your own strength and grit, returning to it with a sense of thankfulness. Many ways to come home, many ways to return home again and again and again. And increasingly then, the green zone, you know, a mind increasingly free of the machinery of craving um, becomes your dwelling place. You dwell there increasingly as those qualities increasingly dwell within you. Now, we're going to go a little farther out. The second, I think, of level of homecoming initially is often understood conceptually. Although many people, about a third of the people worldwide who are surveyed, report breakthrough experiences of what I'm going to talk about now. This is actually a fairly common experience among many people. For example, roughly a third of 411 people here, right, roughly, have had this kind of experience in which the sense of self falls away and the sense of being one with everything in a beautiful, radiant, utterly fulfilled sense shines forth. So the next level of home that I'm speaking here to is pointed to by those kind of experiences in which the way I'm going to talk about it now, you know, less fireworks, <laughs> you know, whoa, <laughs> kind of way is in which there's a, a felt knowing of what's true, which is that <clears throat> our flow of experiences, it's kind of a streaming of consciousness, it's a flow of experiences, is resting in an underlying flow of physical processes. So we have these two aspects of who we are, mind and matter, co-occurring in a flowing way as an expression locally of a vast network of causes and conditions, a vast network of factors that reaches out into our relationships with others and human culture in general, and which reaches out into life, into nature. The air we breathe, the water we drink, the food we eat, which then rests in underlying physical material processes that extend out in very real ways, um, both out in, into space and back into deep time. There can be a knowing that our underlying deep home is this combination of mind and matter as a local rippling in the vast tapestry of reality. This is true. Right? We, we can understand rationally, logically, conceptually that it's true. It's a different thing to start to feel it. Whether you feel it through a psychedelic journey or you feel it through one of these radical, non-dual, self-transcendent, that's what they're called in the academic literature, self-transcendent experiences with all the fireworks, or whether you, as I tend to focus on, and, and, and personally is my own practice, 
you start having moments of awakening, moments of the felt sense where you get it. You, you get that is really who you are. You are a local rippling in this vast tapestry of reality uh, that includes both mind and matter. That's our second level of home, where you really are, you really realize, oh, that's who I am. And being that, there's no problem. I, it's not a self there. There's a person process that extends out into reality and reality feeds back in. That's who we are. And when we drop into that sense of being, problems fall away. There are things to do. There's a breath to take. There's a next beat of the heart. You've got to feed yourself. <laughs> emails to, <laughs> to send out, <laughs> garbage to take out. Not that emails are like garbage, but you know what I mean. Anyway, all that's real, right? But you just sort of feel like you are the ocean functioning as locally as a wave. And you get more and more of a kind of sense of that. There's like flashes and the flashes become more frequent and they kind of increasingly fill the space. So there too, we can remember that. We can have remembrance of who am I actually? You know, your local patterning of reality. This thought you are having right now, this thought is the universe acting locally through you through you. We're like a field through which reality flows. That's true. And we can remember it. The remembrance may begin conceptually again and again and again. The Buddha spoke very conceptually. Teachers speak conceptually. But the real fruit, the real gold, of course, is to have a sense of it again and again and again. And then gradually it becomes kind of almost like a background mood. Like, oh yeah, that's, that's really who I am. When we're upset, when we're rattled, we're shocked, we're startled, we can, can contract away from that knowing, but then you kind of, oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> you know, I am the river, <laughs> not just this particular flotsam and jetsam floating down right now that has triggered me and really, really pissed me off, okay? That's the second one. That's the second one. And now I want to speak to the third level of home, our true home. I mean, I'm, I'm really speaking here about what's true. This is not about making something up. It's about recognizing what's actually true. I want to introduce this with um, two quotations, one from Thich Nhat Hanh and one from, as best we can gather, the Buddha. So from Thich Nhat Hanh. Things appear and disappear according to causes and conditions. The true nature of things is not being born and not dying. Our true nature is the nature of no birth and no death, and we must touch our true nature in order to be free. This is the deepest level, the deepest possibility. People can get argumentative, about this, uh, I can start getting sucked into the classic quarrels between believers and non-believers and in terms of religion and it can start seeming kind of religious. This is really an invitation here experientially to, is there a sense in you of what is deeper, vaster something than, um, ordinary experiences and reality. And here is next what I want to quote the, uh, the Buddha. Bear with me, sorry. Wait a minute here, hang on one second. Well, basically what I'd like to say here about that is, um, here's the quotation. Sorry it took me so long. 
the born become produced, made, fabricated, impermanent, composed of aging and death, a nest of illnesses perishing, sprung from craving. This is unfit for delight. The ordinary run-of-the-mill progression of life. The escape from that, calm, everlasting, beyond reasoning, unborn, unproduced, the sorrowless, stainless state, the cessation of states of suffering, the stilling of fabrications, bliss. The Buddha really pointed to what is routinely translated as the unconditioned. And here's where, in whatever way is meaningful to you, we can have a sense of an underlying timelessness, an underlying space, ground, in which ordinary reality is unfolding. Ordinary reality, including that second level of home that I described, um, mind and matter, it's continually changing, right? It's changing. We can have a sense of what is unchanging through which or in which the changing flow of mind and matter occurs. And people talk about this. I want to honor this. If you don't relate to that third level, if it just seems like way too woo-woo or something, that's cool. Just the first two are incredible, right? Most people are living in chronic homelessness psychologically. The first two are really fantastic. But I also want to, I just want to name as well, there can be an intimation of an underlying transcendental. Some might speak of it as the divine, as God, perhaps. Some kind of underlying, the Buddha called it unconditioned, not subject to arising and passing away, and therefore eternal, therefore timeless. Therefore, that which does not rust, is not subject to birth or death. And in our own practice, to the extent it's real for us, we can have a sense of becoming more available to that, becoming more and more available um, to the ultimate, to the absolute, to the mystery. And if you care about this, there can be a sense increasingly of being rested in that and lived by that. And that's past that words fail. So I see a question coming in uh, about the second and third. For me, the second and third are, are quite different. Um, the second sense of home is a recognition essentially of being allness. We are we are a local expression of everything in ordinary reality, right? But, so there's a sense of oneness, allness within ordinary reality. The third is a genuine encounter with what, to the individual at least, to the extent it's meaningful, and if you're can, you just want to do the first two, totally cool. But the third is really about something that's meaningfully transcendental, distinct from ordinary reality. And for many people, that is a very, very, very important part of their own personal practice. And I want to respect that and be inclusive in, in a sense about that. Okay, so just to bring it to summary and then let's open it up here. Um, remembrance, you know, remembrance. Some, it's sometimes said that the most important thing to remember is to remember the most important thing. Multiple times a day, the remembrance of our own deep nature, because home is our nature um, in, the, in the deepest sense. It's, it's where we go when we're undisturbed. It's our equilibrium condition, when we're not rattled and shaken, right? So first level I'm talking about here um, is the sense of most of the machinery of craving falling away as you feel in the moment, you know, peaceful and content and warm-hearted in the moment, um, then a deeper sense, if you will, or uh, a different, you know, an under, a, a deeper sense of basically just being a local expression 
in the rippling of reality, just a rippling of reality, part of everything. That, that really is who we are. And then third level, some sense perhaps of a timelessness, a possibility, a spaciousness, maybe a transpersonal consciousness, uh, perhaps a, a lovingness somehow that seems beyond your own. Okay. But more than anything, home, you know? Like in uh, Alice in Wonderland? No. The Wizard of Oz, right? A different kind of <laughs> exotic journey. Um, you know, the Wizard of Oz where Dorothy would like click her heels and oh, home, we wanna come home. We all wanna come home. Okay, it's just that simple sense. Thich Nhat Hanh talks about it, you know, I am home, I am home, the feeling of home. I remember uh, reading Suzuki Roshi, a uh, great Zen master. Uh, he was asked once, what is enlightenment like? He said, it's, the, it's like the feeling of home. The feeling of home, finally at home. Okay. So I see that a uh, question has come up. So uh, in most cases, I'll take questions or respond to things through the chat. It's just more efficient that way. But um, I see that Madison, has raised her hand. And so Madison, if you want, I'm gonna unmute you, or I think actually you can unmute yourself. I have to move through the screens. So Madison, do you have a question? Do you wanna unmute yourself? Sure. Can you hear me? Great. Yeah, definitely. It's lovely to hear you. It's completely calming. Um, I just, I, I don't know, it's a comment for a response. Yeah. I, I've noticed that when I walk the hills, in San Francisco. I am completely free most of the mm -hmm. time with a couple of rippling judgments about who I might see along the way. There's a sense of, wow, I was made for this. I absolutely love it. If the day is sunny and I'm looking at the bay and I'm up in the hills, it's great. Um, and, and I had that for a couple of hours today. That's really the good. Rest, That's really yeah. good. Utterly fantastic. And you and want to, almost, obviously, as you know, slowing it down, taking it in, letting it land. So increasingly that kind of gets woven into you. Good. Love it. Um, the rest of the life is um, the what ifs, the struggle, uh, the insecurity, the aging, um, just rage about the aging and, and the and the pains and the aches and the this is and the that's and the and the threatening people when it gets too painful. You know, I'm out of here. I'm just gonna take my life. I'm not gonna do it. And so I'm in that state much of the time. And then when you said the third thing, the unconditioned, I realized that I've had these friends who have died. And when I remember <laughs> them, I feel this deep sense of love mm. like oh that could be the timelessness maybe when i remember loving these friends that's the timelessness but it's normally i'm in that second boat the boat that's i don't like this i'm angry about this i have to fight with this and so i'm aware of those different states but it's very hard to spend more time living in any one of these three homes, other than for the hour that I might do meditation on a given night. So I'd love to know maybe what you have to say about that, because I feel like, yeah, I get what you're talking about. It's just I don't live there very often. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Madison. And I think you probably <laughs> named experiences that many, many people have, me included, and I really appreciate you doing that. Um, it's normal to be triggered. We get triggered. Something happens, our body hurts, we get triggered, and then there's a reaction to the first thing that happens, and then there's a reaction to the second reaction, and then, okay. The question becomes, within a minute or two, if not even sooner, what are you feeding? Bottom line, what fire are you putting logs on? You being each one of us. Okay, we get, we get triggered, we get rattled, but then the question becomes, am I 
feeding it? Am I getting into it? Am I revving it up? Am I cheering it on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Am I pulling in other grievances? Am I ruminating on it? Am I, and I, am I just circling it? The Buddha used the metaphor of a dog chained to a stake. You know, the dog might move around, but it's fundamentally attached to that particular stake, and we're not free, right? Or is there some kind of effort to disengage from fueling the anger, fueling the resentment, and forcing attention? We control our attention. We have control over our attention. And at a point where you realize, you know, I'm just getting into this angry complaint, helpless complaint, helpless anger, doom. You know, I'm screwed. And that's not good for me. Then I have a choice. Do I keep feeding it? Or do I start shifting my attention when I realize this is no longer productive? I start shifting my attention to other things. You know, and that's that's the fundamental question of practice again and again. And with repetition, we develop an increasing habit of almost like a gravitational pull that draws us more and more rapidly and more and more deeply away from those old habitual negative preoccupations. That's a long process. You know, I know you, Madison, we know each other, we're friends, and you've been practicing a long time, you know, and you, you know what I'm saying is true, but it really comes down to kind of a gut check which wolf do I feed, right? The two wolves story. And that's kind of it. And um, there's no replacement for <laughs> disengaging food from the wolf of negative reactivity. And there's no replacement for feeding the wolf of peacefulness, contentment, and love. Uh, I would say that. And then the other thing, of course, is that uh, in general, it's really important to have a minute or more a day when you come home. If, I were, if there's one thing that I think is like a takeaway from this, if, you, if you're not doing any kind of practice in which you have a fundamental experience of home, at least a minute or more a day, that's a lost opportunity, you know? It's sweet to come home, to feel that. And what starts to happen too is you like being home, <laughs> you know, in yourself. You like that sense of, it's not you know, necessarily the world's greatest moment, but in this moment at least, I'm in, I'm in, I'm, you know, there are places inside me that are more at ease, right? And I think also getting in touch with our own warm-heartedness. I've really come to find that is a very important thing, including Madison, for you, you have a huge heart. Uh, returning to the heart, and as we return to the heart, a lot of these self-preoccupations self-referential preoccupations fall away as we focus increasingly on how can I be helpful to others? You know, how can I just move through life in my own heart, blessing people as I move past them? They don't even know I'm doing it. I'm kind of doing it for them, but really I'm doing it for me, right? That's, that's a really good thing we can do. So I'll, I'll finish there and see if there are other comments or questions coming in through the chat sidebar. Um, yeah, okay. So let's see here. Um, so you can you can read the chat, by the way, for other people. You can see what I'm reading as well. And um, well, the so I'm getting questions about that third level. Of course, it's the coolest level in a way. It's the ultimate. Um, I would encourage you, if you don't mind, check out my book Neurodharma. Uh, the seventh of seven key practices is about finding timelessness. And I really tried to respect both um, the deep Buddhist tradition about this, as well as modern scientists and secular atheist uh, mindfulness teachers, whom I respect, uh, who you know are resistant to getting all religious about this stuff. So I would, if you're interested in my take on this territory, um, and including what might be happening in the brain, as we approach an encounter with timelessness. Uh, I would encourage you to check out that seventh practice, Finding Timelessness, in the Neurodharma book. Uh, my own sense of it is that minimally, uh, you know, if people don't think there is a transcendental, okay, I do, and I'm, and I'm not trying to persuade anybody to it. Also, I think the Buddha experienced that and taught about it, although some people interpret his, you know, the teachings that have come to us in a different way. I'm okay with that too. But I think he mostly talked about 
the transcendental through negation as unconditioned, not subject to, to arising and passing away, uncaused, uncreated, right? So possibility, unconditionality, not stuckness, not determined as ordinary reality is, minimal attribute of the transcendental, distinct from the conditioned unfolding, the clockwork unfolding of the Big Bang universe, nearly 14 billion years out. So that's one attribute. Another potentially is consciousness. Arguably, consciousness it might, must be woven into the fabric of reality. Uh, a lot of people talk about a transpersonal consciousness, an infinite consciousness, a cosmic consciousness. In my view, that too is an attribute of the transcendental. And then in some ways, people talk about love, uh, raises questions of how does evil happen, Lily's question at the very beginning. Um, I, I see the a description coming in from Elaine, ever pure, ever wise, ever free. So that certainly purity and freedom. Uh, and then potentially that third attribute of a kind of benevolence, a kind of grace. So you, in ordinary life, without falling into the pitfalls of religiosity, which are pretty obvious looking back over the last 2,000 or 3,000 years, um, if it's meaningful to you to honor your own intuition of an infinite, an ultimate, an eternal, an absolute as the ultimate ground of your being. If that's meaningful to you, that's obviously the, mo the ultimate home. So. Okay. Let's see, where am I here? The first, Barbara. Um, what if you, so for Barbara, uh, what if you don't feel a sense of worth, enoughness, contentment? Exactly. So I want to really talk about that. So the second and third levels, I want to name them because I think it's really important to respect people and to talk about ultimate forms of practice. It's best you have a, an experience of them and a respectful understanding of them. And I'm trying to do that here. So I'm willing to talk about this. But where most of our practice, including my own, lives in everyday life is at that first level of less craving, more peacefulness, contentment, and love. That's what it is. It's psychological. It's biological, that first kind of homecoming. And it's a field of practice that's available to us continually during the day. So what if you can't be in touch with it, as Barbara writes there? Very understandable, right? Um, so what I find really useful is to go after simple, primal, unmistakable experiences broadly of safety, satisfaction, and connection, experiences broadly of peacefulness, contentment, and love broadly. For example, as you exhale, naturally there's a calming in the body. That's accessible to us immediately. If you are thirsty and you drink something or you're hungry and you eat something, there's a primal feeling of satisfaction, of a need met in the moment. The, the animal in us, the animal that we are, relaxes a little bit. The eating gorilla comes in peace. That's available to us. Um, a simple sense of relatedness with another person who's come with a sense of camaraderie, you know, grim humor at the crazy plague we're dealing with these days. Uh, a sense of fellow feeling with others who also are worried and sad and angry about so many needless deaths due to COVID. Over, probably we're pushing 400,000 when you take into, in America, when you take into all the COVID related deaths, COVID itself and then knock on effects. Whoa. So right there, it's available to us. You know, someone looks at you over their mask and kind of you see them smiling like, man, this is messed up, but hey, what? You know, here we are, <laughs> you know, walking past each other on a city street. Uh, you know, that's available to us. So that's really important, Barbara. The, the less sense we have of this underlying um, wholesomeness and homeness in us, the more important it is to look for ordinary, simple, undeniable experiences of it, and then bring a big spoon. 
Really, really take them in again and again and again. Right? So um, that's that's our real home. And as, and as we have a sense of the immediate val validity, it's self-validating. It's, it's, it's clear in your own experience that as you breathe, you can feel calmer. As you get in touch with a sense of your own strength, your own grit, right? I see, Barbara, for example, that you persisted in getting this question out because it got lost in the chat. All right, you, there's some determination, there's perseverance there. As you get in touch with that, you know, naturally you start feeling safer. That's available in everyday life. So really appreciate those. And then if you want, do a formal practice for a few minutes before bed. It's a common practice for me or when you first get up to kind of reestablish that sense of, of a basic sense of calm strength, basic sense of thankfulness for what you do have, and a, you know, getting in touch with your own good heartedness. Just that, bing, bing, bing. Getting in touch with it, stabilizing it, dwelling there, and then getting out of bed and meeting your day. That's available to us all. And what happens is the, um, the goodness and the healthiness of this sense of home is self-validating. It, it's, it's obvious that this kind of home is a good one. Maybe the home you grew up in was not such a good one. Mine was mixed pickles, as the German proverb has it. I've lived in Germany for a year. Mixed pickles, some good, some bad. Um, you know, that was the home then. But this innermost being in which we feel relatively at ease, relatively okay, that feels good and you can trust in it. Okay. So a lot of, a lot of material here. The simplest that I would keep encouraging you to is, are you, are you, are you practicing at all? a remembrance of home. What's the feeling of home for you? In your words, maybe words that are different from mine, metaphors that are different from mine, what's your feeling of home? And then as you can, can you come home? Can you come home many times a day and rest at home and then move out into the world from this sense of home, engage the world from this sense of home? So let's sit with us for a minute or so as we finish up. Knowing also that the more that we feel at home in our own body, at home in our own life, we become a refuge for other people as well. Letting it sink in as we finish here. Thank you.